individual first grow curious about the paranormal? Dare you dig deeper? You are listening to Howl's and Asher. Welcome back, everybody. This is House of Asher. I'm your host, Steve Asher. Uh, we are up on to episode 83. I had to kind of double check it. They're, we're starting to get up there close to that 100 mark, so I'm, I kind of have to kind of keep up with it. And as always, you're listening to us here most likely on Spreaker.com. Uh, you want to join in the chat, go to Spreaker.com and look up Steve E. Asher. That'll be me. And and for some reason, if you're listening to this uh, later on, say, YouTube or Spotify or iHeartRadio or the whole bunch of different formats that is out there that carries the show, welcome to the show. And you know, do consider checking out Spreaker because that is the main source of it, and you'll get it live and can also join the chat. So here we are. It's a, it's a, chilly, it's a chilly night here in uh, western Kentucky, and I think about all the different stuff. I think about the chilling things that you know I grew up reading and hearing about, but it was always the real-life monsters that always got me the got me the worst because you know it's you have these movies and things are dripping green goo and whatever and they're obvious you know you've you got the theatrical scary music but it's the scariest ones were the ones that looked like us the ones that were us in a way and that's what we're going to talk about tonight and my guest Robert Rigi is on the line are you there sir Yes, I am. Thank you, Steve. Thank you for having me on air with you tonight. And good evening, all of our paranormal brothers and sisters. It is going to be um, an exciting and informative um, night tonight and what I'm going to be speaking about. Robert, if you don't mind, uh, give like a little introduction for the uh, people who may not be as familiar with you or maybe it's been a while since they listened to the show uh, because I know I'm, I'll, odds are I'll butcher it. So who, how better to get the information out than from the man himself. Go right ahead, Robert. Thank you, Steve. I'm a psychic medium. My first um, experience, my first um, paranormal experience is when I was four years old. This has gotten stronger and stronger over the years, and I just turned 64 um, this past November. I also have a master's degree in forensic psychology and also clinical social work from the University of Florida. And being a psychic medium and having the experience and knowledge and education uh, with psychology, they work very, very well together. Um, I do a lot of things within the paranormal field, many, many things. Um, I have been involved in two exorcisms that were sanctioned by the Roman Catholic Archdiocese of Chicago. I am mentoring 10 children who are so very talented and gifted. Um, I also volunteer at a hospice, um, and I go into the homes of these children who are going to be leaving this earthly dimension for the heavenly dimension, and we talk about angels and we sing. Um, I am there for the parents as well, um, helping them, helping the child uh, transition. I see angels a lot of times. Most of the times, the children will see angels also. Um, and that is such a blessing to me, such, such a great blessing. I do many uh, public and private events, do many, many readings. Um, people from all over the United States uh, contact me for assistance, and I am here for anyone who needs me. My telephone number is 309-213-0325, and you can call me with any questions. Um, and any assistance that I can be for you. Um, so many people have reached out to me um, since I've been doing these podcasts and doing these interviews. Um, I've been on podcasts and um, internet programs here in the United States as well as all over, as well as the United Kingdom. And um, at the very end of the program, I have some shout outs that I need to do for the people who support me. Um, and, um, and so I appreciate their love and I appreciate their support tonight. As I tell everyone, um, that I am assisting that it is like an onion 
and we have to peel the onion back. As you know, the onion has very many, many, many layers. And so we have to peel the layers back to get to the core of the situation. And tonight, as Steve said, talking about monsters, they can be our family members, they can be clergy, they can be coworkers, they can be fellow students, they can be anyone that we come in contact with. You never know. And so tonight, the program, and thank you again, Steve, um, we're going to be talking about Ted Bundy and give you some um, background regarding Ted of when he got started and what he did and, and possibly why. Um, and I have first knowledge of, um, of Ted um, when I was in school in the master's program there were four other psychologists as long as along with the director or the chair of the psychology department. And uh, we were given permission and Ted um, agreed to it. And uh, so we were with him for about 45 minutes and it was at times the most horrifying. Sometimes it was the, something that I've never experienced before. Well, you know, now, I was going to well, ask ahead. you real quick, just to interject. I'm sorry. Um, it, that was a, extremely kind of a rare thing because, like you said, uh, especially once as they got deeper into the crimes and, and the just the severity of it, um, they're kind of – there's all kinds of different stuff that was happening because of security and whatnot. But, uh, it, it, like I said, it was a very rare thing that you got to do because when you – we had talked about all kinds of things. Like you said, uh, we talked about exorcism. We talked about, you know, uh, ch children with different gifts and things. And I, I don't know how, if, if somehow we maybe said this in passing and I, and I kind of have caught what you said or whatever. Um, and then you said something about Ted Bundy. And, and then I'm thinking, well, maybe I must have texted something that said said and it said Ted and wrote out Bundy. And you're like, no, I met him. And I'm going, that's insane to, to know a person who has come that close to something that dark, but uh, go right ahead. I just want to say it's just amazing. It was, it was, it, it was something that was at the very last moment. Um, the chair of the psychology department had reached out um, to the prison official at uh, Stark Correctional Facility, which is like 25, 26 miles north of Gainesville, where, where the University of Florida is at. And of course, Ted had to agree, um, and being the narcissist that he is, he agreed to it. It lasted 45 minutes, um, and again, my spirit, and, and I, have, I have two angels. Some people would call them guides, but I call them angels. My spirit was just overwhelmed with a sense of um, doom, with um, a lot, I felt a lot of negativity, um, and that began when we were given permission and the day that we were driving there, my spirit was urging me to, you know, to, you know, to pray, um, and, um, and which I did and I pray all the time. I pray for guidance and direction. I pray for protection. I say the St. Michael prayer many, many, many times, many times, um, and meeting Ted um, with these four other uh, master level um, psychologists, we didn't know what to really expect. And I always tell people to always expect the unexpected. And um, and he really and he did what we thought that he was going to do. And I can get into that more. It was it was in. 1979 and I just I remember that so clearly because I keep a journal of everything that I do every day so I have many many journals so I went back and especially yesterday was the 30th anniversary of his execution and I know that it was televised outside the prison some people were praying for him other people were 
laughing and, and clapping and such. Um, what he did to so many women, um, it was just unbelievable of uh, the hatred, the deep seated hatred that he had for women. And people are going to ask, well, why did he hate women? So let's go back. Let's go back to the time that Ted was born. Because what I'm going to tell you will shed a lot of light in, in, in what happened to him. I'm not justifying this at all. Not at all. Um, Ted, was, Ted underwent psychological testing. And he was not, he was not mentally ill, not at all. His IQ was 127, almost knocking on the door of being a genius. Um, so let's go back. So Ted was born in 1946. His mother his biological mother, he thought, who was his biological mother, found herself pregnant. And in 1946, there wasn't too many options. So she goes to Vermont to have this child. And the child is born in 1946 in November, four days before Thanksgiving. She was in this place for unwed mothers for about three weeks, and then she returned home. Ted, as a child, was very stable, did very, very well in school, very, very engaging, um, didn't have any problems at all. Um, and then, and then something happened. He began to, t he began to to realize that something just wasn't right. Something just wasn't right. Now, like are I you said. Well, are you talking ahead. about he finds that in himself, or is he finding that, is it more like, okay, there's something wrong with me, or there's something wrong with the world that I have to affect? It was just the fact that, that, that he felt that what he was told about his birth and who his parents were, wasn't correct right it didn't jive what he what he felt and he and that's what started him on this on this uh, on this downward slide in hating women and what happened was is that ted was told all of his life that his biological mother told him that her parent that they were brother and sister and that's what he grew up with. He grew up with the knowledge, thinking and believing that um, that the woman that he was with, excuse me, um, yes, that the woman that he was with was his biological mother. And so the truth, and so the, what happened was, is that his biological mother in 1974 told Ted that the truth of the matter is, which was a lie, that he told Ted that, no, I am not your biological mother, which she was, but they were brother and sister. And, and that threw him into a tailspin. I hope I'm making sense. Do you understand what I'm saying, Steve? Right, I'm just, I'm sitting here thinking, obviously, you know, this kid is a young kid, and it sounds like the mother had some sort of, some sort of issue, uh, t kind of pulling the rug out from under this kid constantly, and again, not justifying what he did, but obviously he never felt any sort of security in that, and how could he trust women? Right, and he felt, he felt very secure, he felt very secure with um, knowing that the woman he was with was his sister, that they were brother and sister. 
Okay, but the truth of the matter is that the woman who he thought was his sister was his biological mother. And that threw him into a tailspin. So all these years he was lied to, okay? Um, and it just goes deeper than, than that. But that's what started his trust issues, abandonment issues, and it just got worse and worse. Ted did go to several colleges. He did, he did get a degree in psychology. He was very charming, very good looking, um, beautiful blue eyes at the time, wavy dark hair. Um, and then he started to turn to the dark side. Now, what I have heard from several people that knew him intimately, that he had played with a Ouija board as a kid, as a teenager. Now, as we know, the Ouija board can be a portal. And, and so did something attach to him? Possibly. But again, through his psychological testing, when he was within the correctional um, system and when he was on trial, he was deemed not psychologically ill. Um, and so the question is, was he possessed? There's always a fine line between a mental disorder being psychologically ill and demon possession. Okay. And so that's what people have questioned all this time. Well, let me ask you this real quick, and that's, and you know, that's very well possible. You know, you start touching on dealing with something like Ouija boards and this different sort of divination, especially if you already have a sliver of darkness in you, and you're kind of open to new, that sort of experience and whatever. Um, especially if you are sort of the narcissist that he was, you probably thought he could control anything that came at him. Um, but what I wonder too is. Now, I know, did, did he show, like, early onsets of some of the, what to consider classic um, psychopathic behavior? I mean, did, was he murdering animals? Was he doing a lot of stuff, setting fires, all the yeah. stuff that most people tag with that? Right after his, who he thought was his sister, turned out to be his mother, when he, when he found that out, like again, like I said, that's when he began to have a lot of trust issues, a lot of problems. Um, during that time in 1974, he also worked at a um, at a crisis hotline, and people would call there for assistance and for help and such like that. Um, and he really never showed anything prior to that, and not at all. And then the same year. The same year that his, who he thought was his sister, who was really his biological mother, like I said, when that happened, that's when he started to go off the deep end, and he murdered his first victim then. Okay, so that's some, so that's some background that a lot of people don't know that um, about how, how he was raised. And how old was he when he did his first murder? Because, like I said, I'm sorry. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to set up a timeline as we go through this. Do you know how old he was okay. when he committed his first admitted crime? Because I mean, he, there's been said right. that he had, there was others that he would not give details of. That supposedly there were more. Right. He was. Um, he was in a relationship, a steady relationship, I, I, with, with a girl, um, and then she left him. That really. Uh, so again, he was lied by his, who he thought was sister, but really was his biological mother. He was having this steady girlfriend. All the once she dumped him. And that just fed the fuel to have even more trust issues, abandonment issues, anger. Okay? And during that same time, a student in Washington disappeared. And, and so when that happened, and, you, and when 
someone, someone murders someone, and they and they're never caught. And so all at once, the narcissistic part of him came out and said, well, you got away with it one time. You can get away with it another time. And that's what happened. He hated women so much because of his, his biological mother always told him that they were brothers and sisters, okay? And so when the truth came out about that, his steady girlfriend then broke up with him. And again, that just threw him into a rage that really, really just fed the fire. Okay. Again, he was very charming. He was very charismatic. Um, he did things to lure women towards him. Granted, he was very, very good looking, beautiful blue eyes, wavy, dark hair, slender. He was very well spoken. He had a beautiful smile. But what he would do also is that sometimes he would put a cast on his arm. So some of the female students would help him carry his books and such like that. He would lure them to different places, okay? And, and that's when he would kill them. He decapitated four of the women. Um, he had sex with them after he murdered them, but he never had an orgasm. The orgasm took place is when he was stabbing them, when he was decapitating them. Man. And so, and, and so he continues on this rage. He continues to kill these people, to kill these women in the Pacific Northwest around um, in the state of Washington, okay? He gets away with it. Nobody can, there are, and, and at the time you have to realize that yes, we knew of DNA, but it wasn't, there wasn't not a definitive test for it. Right, it was okay? more, in its, more in its infancy than a really a, a more of a precise science. Yes, yes. And so Ted gets away with this, okay? And so he finds himself, and he is, in, so he gets arrested for several things. Um, they don't connect that at all. Um, and so he's let go because, you know, it was one of them was for speeding and other, other things like that. Well, he decides that he, you know, he decides he has to get out of Dodge. Okay, so where does he go? Out, go? So during this time, he killed many, many women, many students. The youngest female that he killed was 12 years old, 12 years old, okay? Um, when he decapitated the women, he kept their heads as a shrine. He would keep them in his car. He would keep them in his apartment. So he decides then to leave the Pacific Northwest. But I must also tell you that before he leaves, there is a connection of where I live in Peoria. In fact, on the road in which I live on, I was, I was in grade school, and there was a young girl down the street with her family. And during the time, Steve, that people, young folks just hitchhiked all over America, all over America. Well, this young girl, she was a teenager when I was in grade school, so I just knew of her, and I knew her family better because they were friends with my mom and dad, okay? And so I had seen her just now and then, but she was very pretty, very nice. Well, she decides to go to the Pacific Northwest and hitchhiking. She was going to meet up with some friends in Washington. And, um, and she was hitchhiking, and unfortunately, Ted picked her up. And... If anybody, anyone knows the state of Washington and Oregon, there are many, many places to go to that are, you know, that are off the grid, as they say. Right. A lot of state parks, national parks, those types of things. It's very, very uh, mountainous, um, um, a lot of forests and such. So he, so the girls with him, I'm not able to say her name uh, because of confidentiality. Sure, okay? understandable. Um, 
but um, and I know that it happened because later on, just but just many many years ago, after that, I was talking with her brother, and her brother is the one who told me about that Ted Bundy had murdered his sister. They had he showed me evidence. He showed me everything. See, that has to be so and, surreal for you, at, you know, I'm, coming through and then dealing with that, seeing some of the fallout from that, seeing the family shattered, and then later speaking to basically the hammer that smashed that family to pieces. I, it's just chilling. Yeah. Yes. And so, um, and so he was telling me this, and then, and then going back to what. And going back to what Ted did after that, so she was his last victim in the Pacific Northwest. He had, um, he had, um, um, Ted had this thing about biting women. He bit women after he had murdered them. He bit them all over the place. He would, he would cut their breasts. Um, he would cut into their vaginal area. He... That's how he got his release um, from all the anger and frustration. You know, he really never knew how to how to come to terms of what he was told by supposedly his sister, but it turned out to be his biological mother. Okay, and so he never knew really how to talk about what was going on. Um, and again, the trust issues um, and the abandonment. There were there were some. This girl that I'm speaking of, he, you know, he cut her apart, and he put her in a um, garbage bag, and he traveled. He traveled from the Pacific Pacific Northwest to the state of Texas. And that's where he buried her, very close to a cemetery, under a pecan tree in Texas. Now, her brother was telling me this. They decided that he that she was buried into what they did. And I'll tell you how they found out about that okay. later on. But they end up having her body exhumed, or the body was exhumed, and she was buried in the cemetery that was very, very close. So no. she was not buried here back in Peoria. Something that's going so through my mind. That, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I, I interject because it comes to my mind. I apologize. Um, you know how, you know, Texas is pretty hardcore. Right. You know, a random road stop, a swerve, maybe a tail light out. Maybe he was, you know, running his hands through his perfect hair in the wind and he swerved or something, right? Thinking he's got right. this. You know, could have it could have ended right there. You know, but for, it's just the way things w- right, work out, right. unfortunately. Right, and that's very true. But again, we have to look at what year this was. This was many, many years ago. Many, many years ago. Okay, our culture was different. Our society was different. Okay, so from so from the state of Texas, he goes to Florida. He continues his rampage of killing women, kidnapping women. He went to a sorority, and that's where he murdered two more women, but other women escaped from him. That's how he was caught. That's how he was caught. Right. And and so there was a trial. And again, I could go into the gore part of it, but it's just the fact that I want to respect these women who were victims. They did not do anything to lure him sexually at all. Most of them were college students. Others were hitchhiking, okay? This 12-year-old girl that he murdered was kidnapped from her home. And again, he disembodied her. He, um, or dismembered her, I'm sorry, dismembered her, um, bit her all over. And that's what his Waterloo was, if I can use that term, because all of his victims had bite marks. Now you'd think with all his intelligence, but again, his narcissism kicked in. 
saying, well, you got, you know, that you, you know, that you did it again and you never got caught. So it's cool. Okay. I, I would but, say if he was a religious man, it's almost like he had a, 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 a providence, like a, a dictate or whatever, uh, uh, you know, uh, just a green light. Nothing's going to stop you. You're impervious. You're smarter than all these guys. And, right. And like you said, he felt like he was a god in a way. I, he would have to have felt like it. Yeah, he did. I mean, he, you know, because he knew he was good looking. He knew he was charismatic. He knew that he was smart. Um, and so he used all of those to his advantage. Okay. Um, now, the Ted that I'm talking about when he was on this rampage was a different man that we interviewed, that we got to sit down and talk with. Totally different. Totally different. So he goes to Texas, excuse me, he goes to Florida, and he goes to a sorority. He kills two of the, uh, two of the sorority sisters. The others escape. That's how he was caught. He, he was arrested. And then the trial begins. Now, <clears throat> there are two trials. And the second trial, that is when he was found guilty and he was then sentenced to death. Now, after he was on death row, this woman begins to write to him and supposedly fall in love. Um, and he marries her. He marries this woman. Okay. After marrying her, she comes up pregnant. Now they were never given any constable visit. They were never, they never touched each other physically, but there are rumors at that time. And there's still rumors and conspiracy about, about that. Some, some guards, um, allow them to have a conjugal visit. And again, that can't be, that can't be proven at all. Right. Okay. But the daughter in which he and this woman had together, there was a DNA test later on. And it turns out, and it turns out correct that this young woman who now is probably in her uh, 40s, 50s, 50s probably now, um, is the daughter of Ted Bundy. Well, do you think that that was done in his, again, narcissistic fashion of going, I will still be out there? You know, right. uh, you're not going right. to take all of me. Right. And so what I'm thinking is that he, that he could have possibly paid uh, the correctional officers to allow them maybe a five minute visit, 10 minute, whatever it was. Right. Okay. Uh, but again, there's no proof at that time. There wasn't hardly any cameras in the correctional system during that time. Um, so it's really hard to say. Okay. But again, so he gets, so he, he marries this woman, um, has a child, um, and, and that is the end of that. Okay, um, the daughter has never has never come um, and talked about any of it, none whatsoever. Nobody even knows her name, but but everyone knows that there was a child. Okay, so here I am peeling the lay, peeling the onion back, getting some bases of of Ted's life as a child, as growing up, now as a serial killer, okay? Now, the term serial killer was invented just for Ted Bundy. Prior to that, that term was never used, never right. used. And so he was one of the most infamous serial killers. I, I put Ted Bundy up with Ed Dean, Jeffrey Dahmer, John Wayne Gacy, and also the Green the Green River Murder, mm -hmm. and we can talk about that because there's a connection 
uh, with John Widgeway. I don't know if you know who that is, Steve. Who was it again? John Ridgeway. Yes. Okay. And he was he was called the Green River Murderer. Okay. In fact, that was the same area, the same area where Ted was from, basically, in that area. Okay. So now I gave some some background information, and 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 I'm not justifying um, anything that he did. But I think that we need to look at the entire picture, okay, of how he was lied by, he thought it was um, his sister, it turns out to be his biological mother, um, and that happened in 1974, his girlfriend then drops him, and it's just, it's just, it's just feeding the fire, okay, he never knew his biological father, never never did know who the biological father was. The mother, his biological mother, who he thought was his sister, had told him several different stories of who the man could be. But the man has never come forward at all. Okay? So again, given, given some um, background information of who, how Ted was raised, okay? I hope, um, I hope our brothers and sisters are understanding why I needed to begin to peel back the onion to get to the core of the situation, okay? And again, I'm not justifying anything that Ted Bundy did. Not at all. Not, I'm not at all, okay? Right. Um, but I think that we need to look at the entire picture because in the news, it was never, it was never spoken about him like early on. It never talked about that he was raised, um, he thought was his sister, but it turns out to be his mother, and those types of things. And I think that will give more of a, will shed light on, um, on his mental status. And again, he was psychologically tested many times, and they always were that, no, he is not psychologically or mentally ill, okay? Do I believe that serial killers or mass murderers have to be, um, have some mental disorder? No. Some of them do and some of them don't. But there's always that fine line. Okay? Okay, so now giving this, giving this some of this background, and now on this, now it is September. It is Friday, September. 14th, and I just remember this day, reading my journal, but going back to it, okay? Right. And we had left Gainesville. We had left the University of Florida, heading towards, um, toward, towards the prison of where he was at, Stark, Stark Correctional Facility, death row, okay? And of course, um, and so of course, you go through all these. Um, you go through all these uh, doors and people are checking you and like for, you know, for contraband and those type of things, you're patted down and sure. everything. We were not allowed to bring any pencils and papers, nothing like that. We were not allowed to have any, um, any uh, device like a tape recorder, nothing like that. We were given 45 minutes and he came in, we were all seated. He came in in shackles, his, his hands were bound. There was, there was um, a shackle around his, um, around his waist, um, to his legs. He was sat in a chair and I was, we were probably, I would say 20 feet from him. There were like four different correctional officers with him right yeah, he was very engaging except to us except to myself and another male mm -hmm. he kept looking at the females he was very engaging to them when the females would ask him certain questions he would he would say oh you have a pretty sweater on I right. like I like the twinkle in your eye. And again, I wrote all this stuff down after I left because I wanted to remember. 
I wanted to remember this experience. But I just, like right now, see, and my paranormal brothers and sisters, just talking about it is like I am there right now. But Robert, and my let me ask you before you get me, very deep. I want to ask oh, I'm you this. Sorry? No, no, no. I, I want to do this before we get real late into the uh, show. How can people contact you again? I try to do that about halfway through again. So if people just join us now, they may have missed the first part. Uh, what's the easiest way to get a hold of you? Okay, you can contact me at 309-213-0325. If you have any questions, need assistance, again, I'm a psychic medium. I do many, many things within the paranormal field. Uh, please reach out to me. My phone is always on 24-7. If you need any assistance, need some information, please call me. Let me ask you one more thing before we get to this again. Uh, I was going to ask, Did when he come out, was the persona different that what you had sort of seen in the trial and whatnot did he show any signs of remorse or wear from the emotional stuff or is he just like hey i'm on it's time to perform try to lure him in no he showed no no he never showed any remorse not at all never and there are certain quotes that i will quote at the end of what he said and it is their hair raising hair raising quotes from him it was unbelievable that he never he never he never showed any remorse like I said um, but he did but he did start to talk or sing like a canary as we say right before they executed him okay and a lot of that was just because he wanted to get out of prison so I thought well you know what in his mind he's thinking well if I start telling where all these bodies are at, then I can get out, out in the open. And that's why he did it for. He was only convict. He only was convict, or he. They only. They believe the authorities believe that he killed thirty-three women. He told them that he killed over a hundred women. Now, when he said that during, when he said that later on, he said it with, as they say, a twinkle in his eye. Okay, but going back to the interview that we did with him, the girls were all dressed appropriately. Um, they were not dressed provocatively at all, but Ted focused on the women. Again, he would say, you have pretty eyes. I like your sweater. Um, I like what you're wearing today. I can smell your perfume. Your skin is nice and soft, and so the, when the when the when the female psychologists uh, were were talking to him, interviewing him, and he would begin that crap, then they would try to circle it around and bring it to back to the question. And again, he he knew what he was doing. Okay, he knew that um, uh, because he was still attracted to women. But if those chains, if those shackles were off of him, he would have killed those women. I guarantee that he would have. Wow. Now, when it was, when it was my turn, and there was another male psychologist besides me, I began to question him. He did not look at me at all. He kept gazing, gazing at the women. He would not answer me. It, when he did answer me, it was like, what the, um, excuse me, I can't use the foul language that he used. But anyhow, you can just imagine what he said in my, you know, uh, just answering me. Right. Um, and again, he focused on the women and not on the other male psychologists and myself. I asked questions like, how is it to be in prison? Do you feel that you ought to be in prison? The only thing that he said to me was, women are safe when I am in here. That is the only thing that he said to me. But let me tell you, Steve, mm -hmm. and our paranormal brothers and sisters who are listening to this tonight, that when you looked into his eyes, they were dead. There was nothing. Those blue eyes had went from a twinkle as a child and an adolescent 
they were dead. There was nothing behind them but pure evil and negativity. It's funny you mentioned that. The reason I was going to say something, uh, I wanted to get that, that piece out. First of all, uh, Robert and Laurie said to make sure to give you, give you a shout-out. And Keith, in the chat room, wanted to know, did anything else make his eyes turn black, or was it only when he was talking about what he did to his victims? Now, when you were talking to him, do you notice that rage building in him? Because it would seem to me like he would kind of see you guys more or less as walls or hurdles to get around to what he really wanted to get to was obviously with the females. Right. When he was talking to the females, his eyes, it, when he first came in, Steve, that his eyes twinkled because his baby blue eyes, I mean, they were very, very striking. Very striking, okay? And, but when he began to talk, especially to the females and then to me and to the other male psychologists, his eyes became dark. There was nothing behind those but just pure evil and negativity. Pure evil. Wow. And so I wanted I wanted to talk I wanted to ask him again how it was to be in prison and the only thing he said to me was that if I wasn't in prison I would kill more. The other male psychologist asked him about about his sister or excuse me asked him about his biological mother and how she lied to him that they were brothers and sisters. Right. He became enraged. His fist became, he clenched his fist, and his body became very, very rigid. And to this day, again, it is like I am sitting in front of him at this very, very moment and feeling the evil and the negativity from him. It's unbelievable. And he did not want to talk about his his, his biological mother, who he thought for years was his, excuse me, thought his, was his um, um, sister, okay? And, but he did not want to talk about her at all. He didn't want to talk about the marriage that he, you know, that he was married. He didn't want to talk about that. But what I got from this interview, 45 minutes, but it went so fast, is that again, if he would have not been arrested and if he would have not been convicted, he would be he would be he would be murdering. Okay, right. That this that this animal needed to be incarcerated. This animal needed to be executed. Needed it, to be put to death. And it doesn't seem like he, like he, he had that disconnect. Like sharks swim, sharks eat. I kill. You know, you, you block me from that. I can't kill. I want to go kill. If I get a chance to kill, I will. And you put me right out. It's right what I'm going to go for. Um, do you feel, as we would mentioned a little bit about in regards to the paranormal aspect, that that is leading more toward some sort of demonic entity with him? Yeah. And that's what, and that's what, that's what I was feeling. Okay. I was feeling that he has to have if someone isn't emotionally sick, psychologically sick, and again, they did all sorts of testing with him, and again, he's a great manipulator, so some psychologists and psychiatrists would say, well, he manipulated the test. <clears throat> and that is always a possibility, too. Because he was quite a charmer. He was a charmer when the, when the, girl, when the uh, female students were talking to him. He charmed them, charmed them big time. Okay, and we were told prior to that that he would do these types of things, and we knew that we, you know, he were that he was going to do it. Um, and so they, and so they would, when he began to go off in another path, then the then the female students then would bring him back to the question, and he really didn't like to be questioned by females. He felt very, he, you know, he he really just to see his gleam and just to see how he smiled at the women, the female students that I was with, um, it, made your it made your skin crawl. Because you know what he wanted. You know right. that he wanted to murder them. 
And I remember one of the female students saying to him, you know, saying to him, calling him an animal. Now, we were told that we could say anything to him. We could ask him any questions. But again, we had to be respect. We had to be respectful. Okay. But when you're sitting in front of a serial killer, for God's sake, how can you be respectful? You know what I mean? Right. It's, uh, it's hard to remain and clinical. And I believe that we're all children of God. I do. Okay. Um, but to be in front of someone so evil, it'd be like someone sitting in front of Hitler. You know what I mean? Right. Um, or, John, um, or John Wayne Gacy or Jeffrey Dahmer or Ed Gein. And so talking to, talking to Ted, we were there for 45 minutes. Um, and again, he did not, he did not engage me. And when I asked him, he was not engaging with the other, uh, male, um, psychology students with us. Um, he tried to ignore us and the other psychology students, the male asked him, why are you ignoring us? Why are you ignoring us? He wouldn't even look at him and straight in the face, at him, you know, his eyes at all. He yeah. just kept looking at the females. He would say, oh, your hair is pretty. Right. I wish I could touch your hair. Complete alpha okay, move. Can you imagine being a female student yeah. and having this maniacal murderer, serial killer saying that to you? I keep in contact with some of the students that I was with, and and they and especially the being the 30th anniversary yesterday of him being executed and and two of those girls that were still friends and we still talk um and they and so we related stories of how the um, how they felt and how i felt um about doing this would i do this all over again yes i would in a heartbeat i would because i learned so much i learned so much um about him and and what his body language was like when you would ask him some questions, his mouth became very dry, and that's an indication that he was lying. Um, he would blink a lot with his eyes. I know that several times that he winked at several of the female students, but again, he was not truly really engaging to me or to the other male um, psychology students. But just to be in that presence, Steve, could you imagine? Being the presence of a serial killer, could you imagine um, j j just how you felt? And then afterwards, I know that some of the some of the female students uh, that were with us were having a difficult time sleeping that night. Of course, we were locking doors, windows, and that type of thing. And I don't blame them. I mean, it was it was creepy. It was right. truly creepy. It was. So, Steve, my question to you is: How would you react? What would you say to Ted Bundy if you were given the opportunity like I was? Wow. Um, I don't know. You know, if it was a thing like he was, say, still on death row, and I knew he had a daughter out there, of course, you know, if he has no disconnect, no sort of social or, or moral compass, I, I would probably ask, like, look, you know, your daughter is out there, you know, maybe running into a creature just like you. You know what? What's your feelings on that? Do you does that? Do you feel remorse for that? Or if you were out there and you found, you know, what if it found out like some daughter or some girl you got was ended up being your daughter? You'd you know you right. molested and, and I would be kind of curious yeah. if it would do anything. It would, it would get any sort of response. Daughter. Never met her. Yeah. Only knew that it was a female baby. Right. Never well, knew. Who she, never saw any pictures of her. Nothing. Yeah. See that. They just kind of like vanished. Right. See, for me, having worked in prison systems and dealt with, you know, child molesters and, and killers and things like that, uh, not right. to the point of, obviously, to the, the heights or depths, whichever you want to put it, but um, it will stick with you, and it stains you. Um, I, I would never want to be a profiler. Um, I take stuff to heart too much. I'm a, I'm a big guy, but I'm soft-hearted, and it would bother me. It would really bother me. I know, I, you know what, Steve, and our paranormal brothers and sisters who are listening tonight, is that we all have different gifts and talents from God. We all do, right. okay? Um, I am not good with mechanical things. Tonight you were telling me what happened to your vehicle, 
and I was trying to understand it, but I don't. Okay, so I don't. I don't, <laughs> I don't either. That's why I paid somebody to fix it. <laughs> <laughs> and, it, and it took me, and this is getting off subject, but when I had a flat tire, it took me an hour and a half to change it. That's how an F I N F that I am when it comes to mechanical things, really. So, but but going back to Ted, 45 minutes really flew and uh, secured in the correction officers, and you are a correction officer, and so they came and said the interview now is over. And they gave Ted one last, if he wanted to say anything, and he did not look at the other male psychologists and myself. He looked at the women again, and he said to them, I wish I could see you walk. He wanted to see them walk. Hmm. That's how that's how sick this man is. But again, psychologically he had he had all the faculties. He was not mentally ill. Do I believe that he was possessed? To a point I truly believe that he was. I truly believe that he was. Okay? Well was Jeffrey Dahmer possessed? Possibly. John Wayne Gacy? Yes. Right. Ed Gein? Yes. The son of Sam, yes. Okay, so I think a lot. I think there are many, many, many serial killers out there that are not that are not psychologically ill, but they are. But they are truly possessed. I truly, truly believe that. I feel that my angels, my spirits, tell me that. Okay, and so and so and so the interview was over. And we, and then we waited, um, and then he left, and he didn't turn around towards the women, and he winked at them, and that was it. Now, the paranormal part in which I'm going to say just briefly, that after he was, when he was executed in old Sparky, in the, in the electric chair, that he grinned in the most maniacal, of demonic grin. Now, I wasn't there, but I was told of how demonic that he looked. That when they, you know, when they turned on the electric chair. Yeah. Okay. Now, there are there are some there are some quotes, Steve. Um, if I can just have a minute talking about right before he was um, before he was. Executed. Do I have time for that, Steve? Yeah, go right ahead. Okay. This is what he said. We serial killers are your sons. We are your husband. We are the clergy. We are your neighbors. We are everywhere. And there will be four of your children dead tomorrow. He also stated, I'm not an animal. I am not crazy. I am not a split, per, split personality. That's all there is to it. People refuse to believe that. They're, that's their problem. There's nothing in my background, I swear to God, and I know it. I've, I've analyzed my own background, and I know there's no doubt in my mind that there's nothing in my background not one factor or collection of factors that would explain or would otherwise lead me to believe that I was capable of murder. The next quote, I am the most cold-hearted son of a bitch you'll ever meet. The last one he said, and I'm not going to use the word, I, I'm as cold a mother blank as you've ever put your blanking eyes on. I don't give a shit about people. Yeah, I mean, and, and that in a nutshell, that's probably the truest he, he had ever been, media-wise. Say that again, Steve, I'm sorry. I'm saying it's probably the most true that he had been or allowed people to kind of see past a mask, media-wise, right. oh, you know? So. Yes, very much so. Now, so he was executed and his, his, his the family... Uh, which is just really sick. 
um, had his body cremated. That wasn't sick. But what they did with his ashes, that the family um, distributed them over the places where these women were murdered. What? And in Washington. Why? That is sick. What? That is so sick. Very, very sick. <laughs> now, what the they've, had, they've had many people executed since then, of course, in the state of Florida. And I know that security, that correction officers will say that they will go by old Sparky, which they don't use anymore. <clears throat> but at the time, for many years later, they did. And they would see Ted Bundy's ghost. They would see Ted Bundy, the ghost, sitting in the chair, smiling and laughing. Just not one correctional officer, but many correction officers saw this. You know, if I can throw in in the last minute that we've got I don't know if you remember the phone call we had the other day and we were setting this up and I was coming in uh, I was in, in transit talking to you and had the freak the freakiest thing happen on the phone line this yes yeah, that's creepy yes yeah, I remember oh, yes yeah. it was really it's creepy it gives me the goosebumps now and you could hear it it was very high pitched and garbled, but it wasn't like another phone was coming in. It was I, I'd never heard anything like that, and I didn't say anything for a minute. And I went, "Did you happen?" And he's like, "Yeah, did, that really weird noise." I said, "Yeah, okay, I thought it was just me or something." And you're like, "No," and I got this right. weird tingling. I, I was in my left arm as I was steering, and then you'd mentioned before whenever you had dealt with something that was evil, you would get a yeah. tingling or sort of a, no, a a no or a tell in your body that told you something. Yeah. And that's on my left side, on my yeah. left side, Steve. That is insane. That, that's so... Yeah, and now, and that, like, tonight, Steve, before we spoke, that I prayed the prayer to St. Michael the Archangel because I do not want his spirit. I do not want to... Um, I do not want his spirit to even be around me. Not no. At, not at all. No, okay? not at all. But again, um, it, there is more that I could go into detail but I hope that our listeners tonight will get a better idea of who Ted Bundy is, was. And again, I'm not justifying what this, what, what this animal did. Not at all. No. Not at all. But to be in, this, in the presence of this evil, and I've been in the presence of evil before many times with demons and such, with those exorcisms, okay? Um, but to have someone sitting in front of you and you feel, you sense, your hairs are standing up on end of just pure evil and hatred. Just and not it, hatred for right. me and for the other students there, but I truly believe hatred for himself. Right. And he would never admit that. In, okay. in the end, this is what his legacy is going to be. That's what he's got left. And, you know, you have people that try to turn, make guys like that into pop icons and and all this and and but in the in the end you have to remember the victims that's what gives takes away from the kind of hollywood show of it and the kind of american psycho vibe of it he was a killer he he destroyed lives destroyed women destroyed families killed bloodlines and that's that is his true legacy but robert uh we're coming to the end of our show. I, I want to thank you again, and I definitely want to get you back on, and we can touch more on some uh, some other interesting subjects because you've got a lot of them. And I want to thank everybody for coming to the show. And uh, if you'll stick around long enough, I want to say goodbye to you off the air. But okay, everybody. and thank you, Steve, and Keith, and Cheryl Ann, and Cheryl Lynn, and Michelle in Ohio, um, to, all, uh, to all of these folks, Brian Cook, um, and to all of the folks who are listening, thank you so very much. Continue to listen to the House of Asher. Steve is a fantastic guy. I believe that God puts us where we need to be at any given time. And my mo my other motto is that we are spiritual beings in a physical body. Good night, everyone. God bless. You heard the man. And please make sure to go to stevieasher.com. And uh, also follow me on House of Asher on YouTube. And... Feel free to contact me at I-L-A-S-H-E-R-S at Yahoo. Make sure to have a good night. Love each other and love yourselves. Don't be afraid to learn and be a little afraid because there's knowledge there. 
So until next time, everybody, stay scared.